black everything all black you know all black in the name of all my black heroes all black everything all black polos all black medallions during slavery much of the service work was within the realm of African Americans, right? They were confined and restricted to this particular area of the economy, largely because, one, that's the work that slaves did, and white folks didn't want to do work that resembled the work that slaves did. And so barbering comes out of that larger tradition. Barbers began as personal servants to, to their masters, who certainly shaved them, took care of their coats, in some cases were their valets, and certainly through that, enslaved men would use barbering to get off the plantation. So in downturning economies, masters would hire out their skilled slaves to earn some extra money. And barbers took advantage of this. And so barbers were often among the slaves who were hired out. And this gave them mobility. They were able to, in some cases, set up shop in the city. And with the earnings from their barbering work, they had to send a portion of it back to their master. And certainly this gave them the space away from the plantation, away from the surveillance of their masters to build some income, but also the space to escape in many ways. And many of them did. But these were enslaved men who hired out who were working with free black barbers. So you have free blacks and slaves sort of working together. So free blacks are hiring enslaved men from white masters. This relationship between barbers as owners, but also as employees and as free men and as slaves sort of developed during the antebellum period. But certainly after slavery, after emancipation, African Americans still sort of took advantage of the process of shaving white men. And so they maintained that practice. And so in thinking about what they had to give up, the ways which race was infused in the service economy, and so black men took advantage of that and they got rich doing it. And so barbers like John Merrick from Durham, who was the Duke's barber, uh, the tobacco magnets, and he, again, got rich shaving them. And he went on to found the North Carolina Mutual Insurance Company, which still exists. Alonzo Herndon out of Atlanta, another sort of New South barber, he used the profits from his barbering business to go on to found the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. And there are other barbers who are situated like Merrick and Herndon, Beginning in the 1890s, a new generation of African Americans entered barbering. They were not as connected to whites as their predecessors were. And so they decidedly opened barbershops in black communities. This is the same time that Jim Crow's on the rise, Jim Crow's being codified, African Americans are being restricted and confined to particular areas of cities. And so African American men opened barbershops in black communities to tailor to black consumers. It's not until the Great Migration that these shops become hubs of activity. If we look at the migration and then look at the Great Depression, we see that these are two historical moments where African Americans particularly had to come together collectively. When someone moved north, one of the biggest questions that they had was, where do I go? <laughs> where do I live? Where do I eat? Where can I find a job? And so the Urban League certainly helped in that regard, but on a sort of a less formal basis, barbershops helped in that regard because barbers were situated within the communities. They would see various constituencies of men, both middle class, working class, and unemployed coming through their shops. And they can tell a new arrival what church they might want to go to or what area they might want to look for an apartment in. And also but thinking about the Great Depression, again, a time where, you know, folks didn't have jobs, needed some help, and sometimes just needed a space just to decompress. And barbershops, in many cases, provided that space to decompress. Barbershops provided this space of community and congregation at times where things were hard, but also at times where things were good, too. Black men went to, and I think, and I argue still go to black barbershops because of the production of black culture that happens in this space. The performance and production of black masculinity cannot happen in white barbershops. That has to happen in places like black barbershops. And so black men go to black barbershops because they want to be around black people. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's something I think very empowering and endearing about that as well. All black, you know. All black in the name of all my black heroes. All black everything. All black polos. All black medallions, yeah. All black, you know, say. All black everything. All black, you know.